you know, my research has shown that, that the human genome is not similar to chimpanzee, at least not like the evolutionists are claiming. It is not 98 to 99% similar, which they need for their three to six million year old evolution from a common ancestor. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, and today I have with me Dr. Jeff Tompkins, ICR's geneticist. Great to be here. Good, good. We're glad you're here. And this is for part two of Biological Evidences for a Young Earth. So for our listeners and viewers, if you haven't seen part one, make sure to go back and watch that. We'll wait here for you. Promise we won't go anywhere. And then you can come finish it out with this episode. So uh, Dr. Tompkins, let's just jump right into it. Yes. Uh, as an overview, we've discussed that, you know, the biblical outline of creation is 6,000 years old and life began just a few days after that. Uh, evolutionists and uniformitarians believe that Earth is 4.6 billion years old and that life began about 3.5 billion years ago. And if we look at biology, we don't see things lasting that long, correct? Exactly. In fact, when we look at biology and, and various aspects uh, of genetics, uh, we see that the human DNA in the nucleus and the mitochondria is only about 6,000 years old, no more than 10,000 years old. So, and when we look at the fossils, you know, we see all sorts of evidence that they were buried very recently, about 4,500 years ago in a global flood. Which aligns perfectly with scripture. So we'll go ahead and jump right into it. You actually discussed this a little bit uh, in the last episode, but we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, and I know that this is something that you're excited about. Um, there is evidence for a mitochondrial Eve. Um, can, so for all of our listeners and viewers and for me, just pretend that I'm really dumb uh, <laughs> and that I didn't do any research. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, so mitochondrial Eve um, would would speak to Eve's mitochondrial genome, which in the beginning was created pristine. And we are talking about a literal Eve a literal from the Eve, Bible. Right, about okay. 6,000 years ago. And so what is the mitochondrial genome? Well, in, in the nucleus of your cells, you have your, your main uh, chromosomes, the autosomes and the sex chromosomes. But outside the cell's nucleus is an energy factory called the mitochondria, and you actually have quite a few of those throughout your cell in the cytoplasm outside the nucleus. And interestingly, the mitochondria has its own circular piece of DNA. Uh, it's about 15,000 DNA letters long. And we could look at that uh, sequence and compare it to mitochondrial DNA that has been sequenced from human humans all over the world. Mm -hmm. And then look at the variation uh, in that. We can also... Uh, determine how fast uh, that variation is created over time based on looking at populations. It, it's called demographics, looking at how fast populations grow, uh, the generation times of people and populations in various parts of the world. And we can actually look at that, uh, that variation and, and how fast it's created. And... So Christians, uh, who are creation scientists, have looked at this data as well as conventional scientists or secular scientists. And so there was a study published in the late 1990s by secular academic uh, scientists, just conventional scientists, and they uh, looked at the mitochondrial genome empirically in the way that I just described. They did not add all of this this deep evolutionary time to their models. They actually use pop population demographics and real, uh, real data to calibrate their so-called molecular clock. And they said that the human mitochondrial genome was only about 7,000 years old. Which is pretty close to the biblical timeline. Which was rather shocking that they would even publish that. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was real data. And so creation uh, scientists, uh, and I'm thinking particularly of Robert Carter, mm -hmm. uh, studied uh, the human mitochondrial genome in depth, and he actually published a paper in a conventional journal, a secular uh, 
journal on the mitochondrial Eve sequence, which he actually reconstructed based on looking at the variation uh, in the mitochondrial genome from sequences taken from all over the world. So what's really interesting, um, about a year before I came to ICR, Robert Carter came to Clemson University where I was working in the Department of Genetics and Biochemistry, and someone had uh, got him a slot to speak to the faculty there in our department, just the faculty. And so we were all in this big boardroom, uh, and Robert Carter presented his data on the mitochondrial Eve sequence and about uh, how that only went back about 6,000 years ago. And at the end of it, he said, are there any questions? And it was very interesting because all of the faculty there I knew very well because I worked with them and, in fact, had got my Ph.D. at Clemson as well. And so even had classes from some of these faculty members. And no one said a thing. Mm. Because the data, you know, was what it was. What, what can you say? And couldn't argue with it. You right. couldn't argue with it, but they all, they all kind of were sitting around with, with, you know, kind of bug eyes wondering what, <laughs> what to think or what to say. But what was really interesting was is that Robert Carter said, well, uh, well, if there's no questions, I've got some books in the back if you're interested. And uh, actually a number of the, the professors there <laughs> went, went to the back of the room and bought some books. So. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of eye-opening for me uh, to see how when, you know, when, when secular academics are confronted with, uh, with empirical data that supports the Bible, it's, there's not much you can say. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I don't know that any of them you know, became creationists or Christians, uh, but anyways, it was very interesting. Cool. Well, we've talked about Eve, and of course, we've mentioned, we mentioned Eve a little bit uh, in the last episode. Uh, let's talk about Adam a little bit. Um, so you had mentioned that, you know, the sex cells. And so we have XX for female and XY for male, correct? Right. So in, in the chromosomes in the nucleus uh, of humans and mammals, um, you have sex chromosomes and you have autosomes. So you just have uh, two sex chromosomes and X and a Y. So females have two Xs. Um, in their cells. One of them has been largely deactivated uh, through chromatin modification. But in males, they have a Y chromosome and an X chromosome. So the X chromosome is, is fully functional, but the Y chromosome is unique to males. That's what creates a, a male. Okay. So uh, we can look at the variation in the Y chromosome, you know, which is would basically take you back to Adam originally. And we can see that the amount of variation in the Y chromosome matches up with a 6,000-year biblical timeline because there's not that much variation in it. And it's also very easy to analyze because the Y chromosome does not recombine with other chromosomes uh, in the genome. So the reason why you look different from your brothers and sisters um, is that when you're, the gametes or the sperm and the egg cells are produced uh, in your parents, there is recombination going on in the genome so that the genomes are shuffled around uh, to create variation. And so that every, every sperm and egg is unique. And so when it recombines, it creates a, a unique-looking person. So that's why you look different from your, your brothers and sisters unless you're identical twins. Right. But with the Y chromosome, it does not recombine with other chromosomes. So it's, it's very easy to analyze and to look at the variation in it and then trace it back empirically uh, based on population demographics. And is what that shows is that Adam was about 6,000 years ago. So, but what's really uh, also very interesting is that there is a geneticist uh, named Nathaniel Jensen. Uh, he used to work for ICR. Now he works for another uh, creation ministry. But he actually took... Y chromosome DNA sequences that were sequenced from, from human males all around the world and that are in the public database. And he ran those into a, in a program that basically lined up the sequences and then created a, what's called an unrooted tree. And then he showed uh, that there were three main lineages uh, in the Y chromosome. It sounds like Noah's sons. And so exactly. So when the earth was repopulated about 4,500 years ago, uh, 
the Bible tells us it was repopulated with Noah's three sons and their wives. And so it's very interesting because the Y chromosome data splits off into three main branches at the beginning uh, of its of its tree. Mm. I can understand why maybe an evolutionist might not be like convinced by that necessarily, but as a creationist and knowing that, Hey, the Bible is true. That's just like solidification of, you know, how true the Bible is right there. Well, you know, there's so many evidences for a young earth from biology, from geology, from astronomy, from our solar system, the universe, you know, and when you put everything together, it's really overwhelming right. that, that the Bible is true. The chronologies and genealogies in the Hebrew old Testament, uh, that, that very uh, specifically indicate a timeline show that the creation occurred about 6,000 years ago. And that's the so, way it is. <laughs> yeah, that's just the way it is. And so, yeah, the, the science fits the scripture uh, quite well. Okay. So we have evidence uh, number four. That's the fourth evidence is uh, mitochondri- mitochondrial Eve and the Y chromosome of Adam, a literal Adam and Eve that lived 6,000 years ago. Right. Okay. So number five, let's talk about, uh, shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about um, living fossils. Now I know in my limited scientific knowledge that uh, there are creatures that are supposedly, they went extinct millions of years ago, according to the evolutionists, but then more recently they've actually found living creatures that are exactly like those fossils. Um, And so they're called living fossils, correct? Right. And so living fossils are, uh, to me, a lot of fun. Um, So let's look at the beginning of the rock record where we start finding fossils. That would be the Cambrian. Okay. And so we see creatures uh, like brittle stars, uh, horseshoe crabs, starfish. And, you know, they look exactly the same as they do uh, today and those would be the oldest according those would to be the, the oldest yeah those would be yeah. supposedly uh, 450 million years old roughly and so why are they found at the beginning of the fossil record they then they disappear in many cases these cambrian fossils for millions of years and then here they are alive and well today uh swimming around in the oceans and, and doing their thing. So it's clearly some sort of trick to confuse yeah, us. So what's going on there? And then why do they look exactly the same? Right. So you look at horseshoe crabs from the Cambrian and they look exactly like horseshoe crabs. We see washing up on beaches today. And in mm-hmm. fact, horseshoe crabs are, are actually economically very important because they extract their blood and use it for a variety of, of things. It's, the blood is actually blue and, uh, it's really bizarre. So you can see pictures on the internet of these, I don't know if you want to call them factories, but <laughs> these places where they have horseshoe crabs uh, all lined up, you know, in these long rows and they're, and they're pulling out blue blood uh, from them. Uh, that sounds like something out of science fiction, as, as but it's very real. Yeah, it's very real. Yeah. But anyways, that's, that's kind of a diversion. But anyways, these creatures uh, are still alive today and they look exactly the same. And no evolution has occurred. Evolutionists would call that stasis. In other words, the creature stays the same. Okay. And what's really interesting is Stephen Jay Gould was a very famous evolutionist. And he recognized uh, this problem and actually admitted that, that it was a huge problem for evolution. In fact, he called it the trade secret of paleontology that we do not see transitional forms in the fossil record. The, mm-hmm. the creatures that we see appear suddenly. Uh, they stay the same. They may disappear in the fossil record, but then be found alive and well uh, in today. Yeah. Uh, or, or a creature may uh, appear in the fossil record, disappear, and then reappear later in the fossil record. But anyways, it's all a huge problem for evolution, but it points directly to a global flood that occurred 4,500 years ago because with these fossils, we, we see soft tissue. As I mentioned in the, the first uh, installment of this, this broadcast. And so we see soft tissue at every layer of the fossil record, Cambrian all the way up to, to the uh, Cenozoic. What about the, I think that maybe this is the 
from from high school because I th- I think that this was kind of a new find when I was in high school. The the coelacanth is that how you pronounce that? That's kind of a famous living fossil. Yeah, the coelacanth is is kind of the rock star of the living fossil world. Okay. Um, so the coelacanth lived during the uh, Cretaceous period, allegedly. That's where we find uh, first find coelacanth fossils. And first of all, let me say the coelacanth was originally thought to be a transitional form that started walking on land because it has these unusual fins uh, that are, they're they're not directly attached uh, to its skeleton. They're called, it's called a lobe finned fish. And so evolutionists originally claim, oh, these lobe finned fish, they look like they could have been evolving to form legs that would start crawling up on land. Mm -hmm. And so the coelacanth was put out there as an actual evolutionary transitional form that started moving from water onto land. And that was the story for a long time. Well, then they began finding coelacanths alive in the ocean. A fishermen were finding them and catching them. And now we have modern divers going down and looking at them, and they've actually sequenced the coelacanth genome. But the problem was uh, that the coelacanth was living in waters uh, that were 500 to 600 feet deep. They weren't even close to land. And in fact, if they were to to get in shallow water, they would die mm. because they were created with these special swim bladders to stay deep in the ocean. And, uh, and, and so they don't get anywhere near land, much less crawling up on land. And so it kind of, not only were they living fossils and in, in found alive and well in the early 1900s, and we still find them now uh, alive and well, but okay. <laughs> but they were not evolving to crawl up on land right. whatsoever. So so that's why the coelacanth kind of was such a big, uh, made such a big splash uh, in the news because it kind of blew apart the, the evolutionary paradigm in more ways than one. Okay, that makes sense. And I, I remember it being a big deal, but I wasn't sure exactly why it was a big deal. But yeah, yeah that, that makes more sense than just being another living fossil. Right. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, So now, briefly, we're going to take a little aside and have our random science question of the day. Okay, are you ready for this? Yeah, I I hope so. You hope so? (laughs) All right. Uh, I remember watching, again, in high school, uh, Expelled. That was a movie that came Mm -hmm. out. uh, And I remember uh, the guy talking to a scientist and asking him, where does life come from? And then I remember the the evolutionary scientist getting really frustrated and yelling on the backs of crystals. Um, and so that's what I, that is the one memory I have of that movie. So I have a question for you. Uh, where do evolutionists say life came from? How did it begin? Uh, I know that we have kind of this idea of like maybe some sort of primordial ooze or like in a puddle, um, did it come from the backs of crystals, according to the evolutionary theory, of course? No, I've actually written about this. Uh, it's in my book uh, on cells that, that we have available at the ICR bookstore. So I talk about the whole origin of life issue. And no, there is no solid evidence that life spontaneously evolved. It's a huge problem for evolution. And and it's worse than this, the standard chicken and the egg idea, you know, Mm -hmm. what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, life um, in the cell essentially is is based, uh, as far as the information part of it, is based on DNA, RNA, and proteins. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need DNA to code for RNA. You need proteins to uh, replicate DNA. You need proteins to create RNA. So every molecule is, is dependent on the other. And of course, RNA codes for proteins and is used uh, at the ribosomes to translate proteins. And that's oversimplified because it's worse than that because you actually need lipids and you need uh, sugar molecules and carbohydrates. Um, You need all sorts of important molecules, even various metal ions that that integrate Mm -hmm. into cellular machinery. And so... It's impossible for all of this to come together randomly and by chance. Especially with this Much many less pieces. replicate itself and then evolve into complex life that we see today. And so evolutionists have basically gotten nowhere with these, these origin of life studies. And there's, uh, 
numerous hypotheses out there. You know, how did life first get going? Did it happen at, near a thermal vent in the ocean? Did it happen in some warm pond on the surface that was struck by lightning? I mean, what? I mean, it's it. I've basically researched this issue, and there's many different theories out there, but none of them have any evidence to support them. They're just wild ideas that scientists have come up with. Probably the closest scientists have come up to uh, creating a biomolecule that is needed for life was in the 1950s when they had these experiments uh, where they were basically zapping uh, a mixture of ammonia gas and and then cycling that through and condensing what came out of zapping it with an electrical discharge, collecting that in a trap and then seeing what was there. And they were able to create some very basic uh, amino acids uh, not not the complex ones that have all these complex side groups and so forth, but some very basic amino acids. But And that's the closest they've ever come. They didn't mm. create proteins. Of course, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, and you actually need proteins to make more proteins. And proteins are these complex polymers of amino acids, and that you need complex cellular machinery to make them. They don't just happen spontaneously. But they did create a few uh, amino acids, but the problem was they created both right-handed and left-handed amino acids, and your body only uses left-handed amino mm -hmm. acids. And, of course, they weren't created in any concentration that was high enough to, to be useful. And, and once again, in order to, to create proteins, you have to have complex machinery to put the proteins together, right. plus information to make a protein that, that does something useful and functional. To me, it um, sounds like all, all of those those things is like they're answering like where I'm thinking like primordial ooze, uh, ocean vent on the backs of crystals. Those all answer where like the location of where they think life came from, but it doesn't actually explain how. No, the chemistry is is basically uh, to, to create life magically and spontaneously is non-existent. It's, it's okay. science fiction. There's no evidence to support anything that has to do with the origin of first life. Okay. And then James Tour is a very famous uh, biochemist who is who is probably the leading uh, figure out there showing how that, that the origin of life um, through naturalistic processes, it, it, it can't be done. It's impossible. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, that little aside. And now we'll get back to the topic at hand. Um, so we've discussed two major uh, biological evidences for a young earth, uh, mitochondrial Eve and the Y chromosome Adam, uh, living fossils. And so our third one, we're going to talk about population growth. Okay. Uh, so I know just from my, if you, if you look at like the population growth of humanity since, I don't know, the industrial revolution, it's like, it's, it's huge. It's, it's been a huge growth spurt. Uh, it's kind of crazy to look at. We went from like 1 billion to now, I don't even know. We're like close to eight. We're 8 billion at this point. So uh, we got a lot of people. So um, according to the evolutionary timeline, uh, humans desert, diverged from apes three to six million years ago. And we've had podcasts with you where we discuss where there's problems with that. Uh, but if that is the case, if humans have been around for quote unquote three to six million years, uh, there should be more people than there are now. Uh, but um, that's not the case. Can we talk about that? Yeah, sure. So evolutionists claim humans uh, diverged from a common ancestor with the with chimpanzees three to six million years ago. And so, yes, we should see a lot more people uh, on the earth if that's the case. So actually, Robert Carter and a colleague uh, actually mapped, mapped out uh, population growth, and they took into account lots of things. They even took into account polygamy, uh, the probability of having twins, uh, you know, the variation that occurs between cultures mm. um, and family size. Anyways, they, they took into account everything you can think of in calculating and modeling population growth. And they showed that the current world's population 
can only be explained by an origin of of three breeding couples about 4,500 years ago, which would have been Noah's three sons and their wives after the flood who repopulated the earth. And they have shown that our current global population fits perfectly with that biblical uh, data that we have. So, and they literally took into account, you know, every caveat you could possibly think of and put that uh, into their model. And so it was incredibly accurate. Uh, They looked at everything you can possibly think of that would affect how fast a population would grow in the various cultures and places around the earth. And it was an amazing study, and they showed that that the current population uh, that we see on Earth can only be explained by a timeline that fits with the Bible and goes back to the global flood. Okay, so, but still there's evolutionists out there, right? There's still people who believe the three to six million years ago divergence, um, and yet we see this exponential growth. Uh, what do, what do evolutionists say? Do they say that like I don't know we just didn't reproduce well before? I don't know. Like what what do they say about it? Yeah, I don't think they uh, they take into account you know the reality that we see uh, in population demographics around the world today. So, and evolutionists actually have many different models, and a lot of them are are based on what's called the out of Africa uh, hypothesis, and so they claim that. The anatomically modern humans uh, left Africa about 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Okay. And depending on the evolutionist, <laughs> you get a completely different model, but, but just roughly that's what they're saying. Okay. Um, but there's some huge problems with that. One of them is we find fossils, uh, human fossils in China that are, have been dated according to evolutionary principles uh, at about 700,000 years old. And we also find uh, human fossils in remote Southeast Asian islands uh, that they claim are roughly about uh, 2 million years old. Which and doesn't so, make well, sense. Yeah, what are all these humans doing all over the place uh, if, if they didn't come out of Africa until 100,000 to 200,000 years ago? Okay. And so... Actually, there is one guy, he's a science writer uh, in in England, and he actually wrote a book titled Into Africa, where he claims that, no, based on the paleontology data that we see of human uh, fossils, no humans migrated into Africa, not out of Africa. That's the exact opposite. (laughs) Right. And so the reason they claim that humans, you know, evolved in Africa and then migrated out uh, was because chimpanzees are found in Africa. That's where we find chimps. And then, you know, as the story goes, supposedly chimpanzees uh, are our most recent common ancestor. Right. And so that's why they do the out of Africa uh, model. And so, you know, my research has shown that, that the human genome is not similar to chimpanzee, at least not like the evolutionists are claiming. It is not 98 to 99% similar, which they need for their three to six million year old evolution from a common ancestor with chimps. They need something that is in the 99% similarity range. Right. And so my research has shown, and that's an entirely different <laughs> Yeah, we actually pod- have those podcasts. podcasts yeah. right? Uh, we'll link those. We right, actually did that. That the human genome is no more than 84% similar, and probably much less cool. than that if you actually took into account the areas that, that you can't even match up. And so, of course, my work was confirmed by an evolutionist uh, at the University of London, Queen Mary. I mean, he didn't set out to confirm my research. He did his own research and came up with the same numbers. So, right. uh, so yeah, the whole human chimp uh, DNA paradigm is is bunk. Um, and the population which is, growth, which is huge, yeah. which is a huge problem for the out of Africa right. theory, as well as all the the human fossils they find around the the world that don't match up with their, their paradigm. So it's falling apart all over the place. Yeah. And that's why within the out of Africa model, you have so many different sub models and, and it's really crazy. It just, uh, and the reason they have all these sub models, uh, is because the, the data isn't neat and tidy for their paradigm. So mm-hmm. they, 
they have to come up with with all these various uh, alternative hypotheses, and of course they they spar and debate with one another over what the real model is. But you know, if they looked uh, at the Bible as being <laughs> as providing a a real timeline and, and a real chronology for Earth history, they wouldn't have all these problems for sure. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's just to review we've got our fourth fifth and sixth biological evidences for young earth we have even adam literal even adam uh unchanged living fossils and we have the population growth so uh between last episode and this episode that's six six for our listeners and viewers uh six very strong evidences that we can use for young earth from a biological standpoint right any closing thoughts no, and it's not just biology that, that is offering um, solid empirical information that supports a young earth, mm -hmm. or, according to a biblical timeline, but it's also geology. Uh, it's even the oceans. I actually published an article on the oceans and why various things uh, that we see in regard to the, the, <laughs> the oceans around the globe point to a young earth, mm -hmm. but also astronomy, uh, evidence from our solar system, evidence uh, from outside our solar system, even evidence from the new uh, Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. All of it, all together, is presenting an overwhelming picture that the biblical timeline and chronology is accurate. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this podcast. It's always a pleasure to have you on. So, All right. It's great, yeah. to, great to be on. Yes. All right. And thank you to our listeners and viewers uh, for joining us once again. Remember, this is part two. If you haven't seen part one, go watch it. Uh, we'll actually link to the episodes uh, about Dr. Tompkins' work with the chimpanzee and human genomes. Uh, we'll link to that in the description. Make sure to like, share, subscribe. Uh, we just want to get the word out to as many people as possible. And we need to just reiterate and reiterate that Jesus Christ is our creator, our savior, and our coming king. Uh, it's all about him. To God be the glory. We'll see you next time on the Creation Podcast.